Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Indy's workers can survive. Make it Indiana's minimum wage hasn't gone up in more than five years. If Indiana raises the minimum wage, it will be because the federal government says it has to. We'll explain why Democrats say their priority this session is helping working class Hoosiers, while some Republicans argue raising the minimum wage would put hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers out of work. Academic leaders in Indiana are praising President Obama's plan to offer free community college. It's critically important. The U.S. is behind the rest of the world. This can close the gap. Ahead, more on the president's proposal. Plus, the latest on this week's top headlines. Right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to Indiana News Desk. Since 2009, the federal minimum wage has remained stagnant at $7.25 an hour. As a result, we're seeing more states getting involved to boost the pay for their lowest earners. 29 states and the District of Columbia now have a minimum wage higher than the federal minimum. Democrats have tried to lead a push in Indiana, but can't get past the Republican supermajority. They're trying again this session, but as Sarah Whitmire reports, the outcome seems unlikely to be any different from the past. That's pretty cool that you're doing any work These are the moments Shanika Jakes lives for, seeing her son happy and talking about his day at school. I don't like disappointing my kids. Jakes has four kids, but only her son is living with her right now. He's wanting to be around his sisters, this is all that he says. And it's like now it's kind of getting tough because he's acting out. He's not wanting to listen. It's just like I want my sister and I want what I want. And it's just, it's getting difficult. Make no mistake about it. Being with her children is what Jake's wants too. I can only maintain just one right now on the income that I'm on. It's like sometimes it's your turn, sometimes it's not. Jake's makes minimum wage, $7.25 an hour, working part-time at an Arby's not far from here. Her paycheck can usually cover one, maybe one and a half of her bills. After a while, it's like when you're paying partial, it just puts you back further and further and further. It makes the balance higher. Her situation right now is pretty dire. Jake's doesn't have heat, so she's using her oven to keep herself and her son warm. She recently moved into this house on Indianapolis's northeast side, and she's already behind on the rent. Right now, my rent hasn't even been paid for January because of my check and how he had me scheduled. I didn't have enough but $50 to give to my rent man. At the State House, some legislators are pushing for a session dedicated to folks like Jake's, working class Hoosiers who are struggling to make ends meet. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 108,000 Hoosiers earned the minimum wage or less in 2013. Democrats want to make it so no one who works a 40 hour work week falls below the poverty line. They have two proposals. Each would raise the state's minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. One would do it in increments and the other would do it in one fell swoop. It's part of the national movement, obviously, uh, but I do think that it faces a tough uh, battle here in Indiana. 29 states and Washington, D.C. have a minimum wage higher than the federal level, and that number is growing. I think if uh, Indiana raises the minimum wage, it will be because the federal government says it has to. Governor Mike Pence laid out his priorities this week during his annual State, State of the State address. Hoosiers are going back to work. Democratic leader Scott Pilath says the speech was telling for what wasn't in it. There's still people that are struggling out there. Their happy gas prices are down. That's the first good news they've had in a while. Didn't have anything to do with Mike Pence. Um, 
they're happy that there's a national economic recovery and that the national economy is growing. Didn't have anything to do with Mike Pence, but they're also struggling in terms of their household income. That's not getting better. Arguments for and against raising the minimum wage can both be backed up with research. Proponents of a wage hike maintain if you put more money into the hands of low-wage earners, there will be more money flowing through the economy and everyone will win. Opponents say businesses, particularly those in service industries, will feel a huge hit and be forced to cut workers. The Congressional Budget Office estimates a half million people could lose their jobs if the federal minimum wage goes up to 1010. So where are those 500,000 jobs going to go away? They're probably not going to go away in places like California, Washington, Oregon. These are states that most of uh, most of the locales there have minimum wage laws that are higher than the federal minimum and are probably even higher than the, the 1010 mark. Those jobs aren't the ones that are going to go away. The ones that are going to go away are in places that are low cost, low wage states like Tennessee, Indiana. That gets to the idea of a free market and the idea that if the market demands additional wages, pay will go up. That's the tone Indiana's Republican supermajority has taken when similar proposals have been introduced in previous years. They also point out that while Indiana ranks among the worst in the nation in per capita income, the cost of living is also low. Back at her house, Jake says meeting her basic needs are still difficult. I would just say to the, legis the legislators that just put yourself in our shoes, not being able to cover, you know, the rent or cover a light bill and go without gas and it's winter and it's cold. Like, I just think they should just put aside, like, come down off the high horse that they're sitting on and just come into our lifestyle for a day or two and just see what we have to struggle with and go through. And then maybe their, act, um, their vision on it would be different. The profile of a minimum wage worker is a point of contention. It's an often heard argument that raising the minimum wage would likely benefit young people who are only working these jobs part time and temporarily until they get older and move into other types of work. The data shows those who are trying to hold a family together on a minimum wage salary like Shawnika are a small subsection of those making the minimum making the minimum wage. However, most of the workers who earn minimum wage are adults. Shawnika is working on her diploma and hopes she'll be able to get a better paying job. We'll continue to follow the minimum wage proposals this session if either gets a hearing. The chair of Senate Labor Committee has said, however, that he doesn't plan to act on the issue. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dirkman. Thank you, Joe. Changes to Indiana's redistricting system likely won't happen until at least 2017. A proposal from House legislative leaders creates a committee charged with studying redistricting for the next two years and compiling a report due in December of 2016. The committee would consider several issues, including state and federal redistricting laws, the cost of changes and redistricting systems in other states. The state constitution says redistricting reform can be approved every 10 years. Republicans who wanted to start the process a year or two ago are worried there isn't enough time. House Speaker Brian Bosma says a resolution to amend the Constitution would give lawmakers enough leeway to enact reform. Indiana's congressional leaders are gathering support for a measure that would redefine full-time employment as 40 hours per week. Under the Affordable Care Act, businesses now have to provide health insurance to anyone working 30 hours or more per week. If passed, the bill would mean companies would not have to provide health insurance to anyone working less than 40 hours each week. Senator Joe Donnelly is sponsoring the measure in the Senate, and the 9th District Representative Todd Young sponsored a similar bill House members approved last week. Human resource experts say the bills are in line with current job trends. The 40-hour work week, as we traditionally thinking, think about it, has been consistently eroding over time. Uh, the actual hours worked by people, generally speaking, is a couple of ticks below that, 39 to 38 hours on the total. And that's for a whole variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. Opponents of the measure say it allows companies to skirt around the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and adds to the nation's deficit. 
It's a problem no one wants to see repeated. Interruptions during the I-STEP test. In 2013, delays forced schools to, to suspend testing for two days. This week, schools across the state administered stress tests to check for server problems. Some districts reported that it was impossible to do the test because of timeouts and other problems. The testing company CTB McGraw-Hill doesn't have long to work out the issues. Students are expected to take the actual I-STEP test in two sittings, one in March and the other in late April. A Kokomo senator is fighting to stop work on the city's baseball stadium. Jim Buck filed emergency legislation this week that would authorize the Indiana Department of Homeland Security to intervene and halt construction on the project. The baseball stadium is being built in a flood prone area, which Buck says could cost the state millions in federal funding. Records show the city has to keep the space open per regular or er, for per federal regulations and grant requirements, which Buck says aren't being met and threatens federal emergency management agency dollars. A Kokomo official says the city is working with FEMA and hopes to have a resolution by the middle of next week. Governor Mike Pence's priorities this year include education and the budget. That first one, education, is something he's been saying for a little while now since he declared the 2015 legislative session an education session and spoke about the need to increase pre-K funding and access to high quality education. He surprised some this week, though, when during his State of the State address, Pence proposed adding a balanced budget amendment to the state's constitution. As Barbara Harrington reports, some are calling the proposal unnecessary. Governor Mike Pence is calling on legislators to add a balanced budget amendment to the state's constitution, a measure several other states already have in place. A balanced budget requirement in the constitution of the state of Indiana will assure Hoosiers that today and tomorrow, Indiana will spend wisely, protect our state from an economic downturn, and unlike Washington, D.C., we won't bury our children and grandchildren under mountains of debt. Article 10, Section 5 of the Constitution already says no law can be authorized that creates debt. But House Speaker Brian Bosma says adding the balanced budget amendment is a good goal. There has to be a healthy discussion about whether a balanced budget includes spending reserves or not. Uh, that's why uh, the constitutional amendment has to have flexibility in it because under that definition you would only build reserves in perpetuity and would never be able to spend those funds. Democrats say they're all for a balanced budget, but they don't think the amendment is necessary. They see it as a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Perhaps he doesn't trust his two super majorities to deliver a balanced budget, but I tell you what, he could be playing with something of which he has no idea. Maybe he's proposing something that might force tax increases at the state and local level down the road. Perhaps he'll be forcing ideas from which he'll be long gone and long departed by the time we feel the consequences here. Pence's proposed balanced budget amendment would have to be approved by voters. The earliest it could be on the ballot is 2018. The Indiana Court of Appeals Wednesday ruled that the state's tort claims cap, which limits how much money people can sue the state for, is constitutional. The lawsuit revolved around the 2011 State Fair stage collapse. Only one injured victim did not accept the state's settlement offer. Part of the victim's lawsuit over the tragedy challenged that claims cap, which was set at $700,000 per person and $5 million per incident. In a statement, Attorney General Greg Zeller said the purpose of the cap is to protect taxpayer dollars. There's no word on an appeal. Duke Energy is awarding the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation a $15,000 grant that aims to help cities and towns better understand the impact of new interstate highway systems on communities. The commission plans to use the funds to examine land use strategies for the new Interstate 69. As we've pre previously reported, this is something Monroe County has tried to stay on top of, hosting public forums to explain the changes I-69 will create. The commission's concern is with employment opportunities for the community. They hope to explore how these strategies might affect retention of existing employers who are already creating jobs in the area. Bloomington Mayor Mark Cruzan is endorsing City Council President Daryl Neer in his bid for mayor. Cruzan announced this November he would not seek a fourth term. Neer received a standing ovation last night when he announced his candidacy at the Buskirk Chumley Theater. This community uh, is at its best when it is collaborating and when government is engaged and that's what we're going to do in this campaign is, is let people know exactly what that looks like within policy. 
Neer, who co-hosts the weekly special on WTIU, will face businessman John, John Hamilton in the primary. Hamilton unsuccessfully ran against Ma Mayor Mark Cruzan in 2011. One of Bloomington's historic leaders, Tony Pizzo, died this week at the age of 93. Pizzo and his wife, Patricia, moved to Bloomington in 1951. He taught at IU's medical school and, operate, and operated Bloomington Hospital's pathology lab. He served as Monroe County Coroner, as a member of the General Assembly, and on the Bloomington City Council, where he authored the city's smoking ban. Fellow council members say Pizzo left a legacy of service and dedication to the community. Pizzo's son, Angelo, is a screenwriter and producer best known for the films Rudy and Hoosiers. And a new website is designed to help Hoosiers make more informed decisions about their health care. The Indiana Hospital Association recently launched MyCareInsight.org. You can use the site to compare Indiana hospitals by quality and cost. The site displays public hospital charge data from the Indiana State Department of Health and allows visitors to compare Indiana hospitals side by side. You can also search the site to look up charges by location, hospital, and procedure. The president of the Indiana Hospital Association says the website is part of a growing movement to provide more price and quality transparency. And Cummins, official, and Cummins officials say a new truck and engine will return life to one of their Columbus facilities. The new V8 diesel engine is powering the 2016 Nissan Titan XD. The engine has been in the works for a few years and was produced in the company's first engine plant built in the early 1900s. The facility suspended produ production in 2003 when production lines were moved to another location in New York. It's a meaningful day, it's jobs. It's, it's uh, the economic livelihood of the community, and it just rein, it reinforces that uh, Cummins remains committed to good old Columbus, Indiana. And Joe Caldwell estimates that there's somewhere between 600 and 800 jobs that were formed in the production and manufacturing of this engine. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. Yes. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Terre Haute is hoping to turn its wastewater into cash, but millions of dollars the city was promised haven't come in. We explain the controversy behind the business deal and what lessons other Indiana cities could learn from Terre Haute struggles. And President Obama proposes free tuition for community college. But is the plan as good as it sounds? We talk to education experts about who will benefit from the measure and whether it will boost college graduation rates. These stories right here on Indiana News Desk. We believe in the excitement of exploration, that life offers each of us adventures that are ours for the taking. We believe that children are born explorers who need trusted guides on their journeys of discovery. We believe in breaking new ground and in challenging assumptions that important questions deserve to be explored deeply, fairly, and honestly. And we believe that who you are and where you come from should never stand in the way of what you want to be. This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. In December, Terre Haute was slated to receive $3 million from a business deal with the company in California. It's been two weeks since that deadline and the city still hasn't seen the money. Reporter Casey Kuhn has been following the story and is here to explain what this could mean for Terre Haute and other cities looking for innovative ways to raise the revenue. Thanks for being here, Casey. So you got a hold of the contract between the city and Power Dye. What are some of those stipulations in that agreement? Well, Joe, Powerdyne initially reached out to Terre Haute to propose this partnership and uh, they could bring a facility to the city to turn their wastewater sludge into diesel fuel. Now, the city already pays to haul their sludge to Kokomo and this contract stipulates that the city would get $3 million last year and $3 million this year. Now, we haven't seen that money yet, but the city is also slated to pay Powerdyne over $700,000 per month for 20 years. That's what the contract says. 
Now, as far as anyone knows, the city hasn't paid Powerdyne any money yet. Now, these numbers kind of seem confusing. It seems like the city might be losing money on this or no? Well, we don't know. Powerdyne promised that they would generate a million gallons of fuel from the waste each month at $2.50 a gallon. Uh, the city would then buy that fuel from Powerdyne and sell it to a third party for the market price. Uh, Mayor Duke Bennett agreed to this to drum up revenue for the city's budget. Uh, like a lot of mid-sized cities in Indiana, Terre Haute has been struggling for money. Oh yeah, and uh, property tax caps, of course the recession. So this was a way for the mayor and the city to find um, some some new revenue. Right. Uh, mayor Bennett factored that th expected $3 million into the city's budget last year. Uh, now Bennett has to figure out uh, how to make up for that missing money since it hasn't come in yet. Bennett says he is in touch with Powerdyne and that they're reworking the contract right now because uh, some language wasn't considered legally sound. Here's what Bennett had to say this week. So why not Terre Haute? I mean, to me, it's like, it's a perfect fit. And if for some reason, if they fail, contracts go away, we'll go back and hire the other company, and we'll have to pay them to take our sludge away. So there was a city council meeting last night in Terre Haute, and what happened there? So the city council asked an engineer to come up and comment to see if these plans are even possible. And the engineer actually told the city council that the city would never actually be able to make enough sludge to make the fuel being promised by Powerdyne. Uh, an engineering expert I talked to over the phone today said the same thing and that even if the facility is built, it probably wouldn't bring much money to the city. And here's what he had to say. Terra Haute system is mostly a wood to fuels uh, operation. So the sludge to fuels is kind of a Trojan horse in a way. The sludge carbon is only like a, a tenth of a percent of what they really need. So the whole process is uh, dead on arrival as far as I'm concerned. So essentially, uh, Terre Haute would have to be bringing in more sludge from other places, which would cost the city more money. And our expert says the process to convert that sludge to uh, diesel hasn't been done anywhere else. So it is in theory possible, but we don't know how. Okay, very interesting. We'll have to keep on that story. Thank you very much, Casey. Thanks. During his State of the Union address later this month, President Obama will outline a plan to make community college tuition free, an effort to get more Americans' education or training beyond high school. As State Impact Indiana's Claire McInerney explains, advocates in Indiana don't regard the president's plan as the silver bullet, but they were hopeful it will start a conversation about affordability they say is long overdue. When Pavel Rakowski came to the United States from Poland more than a decade ago, he found work in construction for almost nine years. Then... I got injured and uh, because of that, you know, I had to look for something else and uh, I finally realized, you know, I think I need the degree. Students like Rakowski are the inspiration for the president's plan. People who realize a high school diploma won't cut it in the real world, but don't want to pursue a four-year degree. Here's what Obama's proposing. If a student maintains a 2.5 GPA while attending community college at least half time and is working toward a degree, they won't have to pay any tuition. The logistics of how to pay for this plan and whether Congress will even pass it are still unknown. But higher education advocates are thrilled the White House realizes something they've known for a long time. An education that stops at high school is not enough for today's world. Snyder says that's why community colleges are more important than ever. We're replacing K-12 with K-14, and what that means is that everyone is going to have to be pursuing something beyond high school. K-14 through is a new catchphrase being used in the education field, but it supports the years-old idea that nearly all of today's jobs demand training and education beyond high school even traditionally blue-collar work. If you walked into a manufacturing plant now, especially one of our auto industry plants, for example, you'd see robotics going on. The education beyond high school is necessary. That's where the idea of K-14 through comes in. Higher education, whether a bachelor's degree, associate's degree, technical training, or certification, is so necessary, it's already ingrained into the current model of K-12 through education, with high school students taking AP classes or getting technical training before they even graduate. The idea of providing community college for everyone seems a little lofty to lovers, and she sees the president's suggestion more as a positive step in the right direction than a solution. Personally, I think it's not likely to happen in one legislative session of Congress. It's a significant change in the way that we deal with these issues. 
while not in any way taking away from the importance and the value of having a conversation about affordability. And with post-secondary education moving closer to being a requirement, higher ed advocates say discussing how to pay for college is the most important conversation. The idea of let's make it simple, make it transparent, make it clear to students and families how much college actually is going to cost and how to pay for it, there's a real opening there to make that the case. And Matthew says making community college free doesn't mean students will rush to enroll. Because for many students, money isn't the only barrier. They also struggle to overcome negative attitudes towards school, for example, or have difficulty balancing their time between classes and raising a family. For Rakowski, getting a degree was one of his only options after getting injured, and he's doing it with one end goal in mind. After I'm uh, done with my associate degree, um, of course, I'm just going to hit the job market and try to find a good job. President Obama will outline his plan to make community college free in detail during his State of the Union speech January 20th. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you.